I had a very, very good undergraduate advisor there that said, well, you may like invertebrate zoology a lot, but how will you eat when you're older? <laughs> and he really encouraged me to pursue something a little different, more biomedical. At that time, it, most women did not get accepted into medical school. I did take my MCATs, I applied, I got accepted everywhere I applied. There were no student loans then, and this is not what I really wanted to do. I really didn't want to do that. Um, so I decided to go to graduate school instead. And of course, my sister, when she found out about it, told my mother, and my mother was mad at me for years. So I went to NYU. They have an Institute of Environmental Medicine up there because I still had to get the environmental cue in there. But I wound up, you know, there weren't a lot of, there, there were a lot of fellowships, but I had come in, and the one that they had open that was the nicest one financially was with what they called the ogre of the department. I'm like, well, he looks like a nice guy. He can't be that much of an ogre. And everybody warned me against going to work in this lab. Well, it turns out he, I probably learned some of the most that I learned from him, okay, from him, that I still use in the lab a lot today. Like making sure people know, well, he used to, anytime we use a chemical, he used to make us learn the structure. But don't ever use anything without knowing the structure. Not in his lab. But you had to know everything about it. Which is a good thing because how many students come in now and say, okay, I need XYZ chemical, pull it off the shelf and let's use it, and they don't know anything about it. And I think that happens a lot. Uh, and ways to keep lab notebooks, okay? I'm a fanatic about lab notebooks, basically because we do a lot of patenting in the lab too, but he developed that, all right? How to write down everything because you're going to forget it. And I say, oh, he's just an old right. So he was right on a lot of things and I spent a lot of time with him. And uh, I, So the lesson there is if somebody says that somebody's an old crotchety person and don't go work with them, think twice and learn for yourself. Because many times the reason is there's a difference I think between old and cranky and success, successful at what they do and having a way of getting there. And many people think that that's you know, they interpret that as cranky, and he says, no, you have to do it this way or this way. But maybe they know a little more. So you can never, never, well, never judge a book by what anybody else says about it. Because um, I had very fruitful years, and I did really well. It took me to a lot of meetings. Uh, I, I had a, a really good, good time working there. After that, uh, my husband was sitting over there, and I opened up an environmental testing and analysis business. We worked, we ran that for two and a half years before it became a 48 hour a day business. And we sold it very successfully. Uh, then I was at Old Dominion University in Eastern Virginia Medical School. So I spent uh, three years there and then I was at Medical College of Virginia. Um, at Medical College of Virginia, I worked for the cranky person there too. He really was cranky. <laughs> but that's okay. You got to look at what they're pushing you to do to help you get along, to help you get out, to help you move on your career, to help you go from just the bench top to a, uh, an assistant professor, but still end up doing some of your lab work yourself. A lot of people come in, get out there and think, okay, I got my first assistant professorship job. Where's my technician? It's not going to happen. As funding improves, though, you yeah. know. And um, let's see, MCV, I was there for about six years, where I developed most things. And, and, and this is another thing where you can't be sure of what you're going to do. I went from liking invertebrates to an MCV, okay? I started working in neurons. Prior to that, when I was at Old Dominion in Eastern Virginia, Matt, I worked in macrophage, the immune system. And I swore I never wanted to do anything with neurons because all the literature I saw, they had every ion channel in the book and they were too, too confusing. Because I did a lot of ion channel work. And sure enough, there I wound up. And I've been working on the brain, traumatic brain injury and other forms of neurodegenerative disease ever since. 
So I was there for six years, then I got my first R01 to study microglia, which are the inflammatory mediators in the brain. Uh, and then, of course, I moved on to a regular, from a research assistant professor position, which is not hard money, to a tenure position at University of Central Florida. So I was at Florida for two years, then I got involved in nanotechnology and started talking to the physics guys and started getting uh, grants related to nanomedicine, which is a lot of what we do now. Um, and then moved up here when VCOM opened because they were looking to move out of Florida because it was just too hot. <laughs> it really was. You walk out the door and it's like, close the oven door, you know? It's not even a front door, it's an oven door. So it was just too hot, so that's how I wound up here. But remember, it's a very circuitous path. They say that, I read in, I believe it was Science Magazine, that somebody getting a PhD in science can expect to make a major move three times in their life, at least three. So do I have my three? One, two, yeah, I got my three. Okay, New Jersey to Virginia, Virginia to Florida, and then back to Virginia. But did I have that path planned? No. You know, when I left NYU, I thought I was gonna stay in environmental medicine, testing and analysis. When I got done with that, well, I didn't think I'd go back to this, and I did, and I worked in the immune system, so I'd never go into the brain, and by a circuitous route, wound up there. And I have a lot of <clears throat> undergrads that come into lab to work for the sons and stuff that I need to figure out exactly what I'm gonna do, exactly what I'm gonna do, one, two, three, four. And I'm like, why are you doing that? <coughs> because you're gonna change your mind in five or 10 years anyway. I can do that? I remember Julie, yeah. uh, it, one in particular that said to me, I can do that? Yes. So I don't have to like decide for sure forever now? No. And I think that's um, something that a lot of people think they have to do and really don't. So who's got questions about how they want to proceed? Why are you laughing? Oh, I didn't think it was either. Well, oh, now you have yeah. some questions now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Questions anymore? <laughs> <laughs> where do you think, where do you think you're going to wind up? Oh, I have nothing. What? Um, well, maybe the CDC. Okay, that's cool. Brett, you're a graduate student now? Yeah. And you're looking for advisors or you found advisors? Um, I'm doing rotations right now, but okay. um, my first one was really great, so. Yeah, you need to be careful on the advisors that you pick. I kind of got lucky, even though I worked for some ogres. I got very lucky. Uh, and, 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 and at that time, it was kind of hard because the only people that could get the graduate students were those that were funded, that had funding to cover them for, say, the last two years of their, or whatever. And you need to look for somebody who's going to have the funding to keep you going for your five years. The departmental support gets along well enough with the department and maybe has enough um, <coughs> chutzpah, as they, it's a New York word for, what, what would you define chutzpah as? <laughs> well, look it up. It's spelled C H U T Z P A. Uh, to back you up on something that others may consider irrational or wrong or not the right road. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of professors now that are really well known that started off and in their graduate career, career, they started doing something where their advisor told them, it's never gonna work, so go ahead and waste your time. And they went ahead and wasted their time and got some really nice patents out of the deal and, and some very nice developments. Some developed uh, immune testing kits, fluorescent dyes, things that they've you know, done very well with. So you need to have somebody that'll let you do something a little irrational if you wanna do something irrational. I mean, it's always good to do it, not all the time, but it's good to do a rational thing. 
And then sometimes they'll tell you to do that and you'll make a fool out of yourself and you'll learn never to do it again. <coughs> These things happen. Who else is looking for advisors that is kind of confused about how to do it anybody? to look for the next step um, once graduating looking for a postdoc. So do you have any, I guess, advice for, if you know what your long-term goal is in your career, but you have to follow kind of that normal trajectory once yes. you graduate to kind of you know, establish yourself. Do you have any advice for where you still are improving yourself on those skills that you want to have for your later job, but still learning, you know, and be respected in the field? Still fulfilling yeah. the postdoc thing. Well, what's your ultimate goal after you um, go more administration? Okay, so you would want to, you know, postdocs are hard. They're they're becoming harder and harder to get. I know several that are, are having trouble getting them now. Um, you want to go to somebody that's got a reasonably good reputation. So you, even though you want to go into administration, you can get some published papers in some high impact journals. But you want to stay steer clear of, there are many labs, and, and I review for several of the NIH programs, where you'll have a mentor come in for another postdoc, and they're writing, um, and what they'll be doing is writing a grant for that postdoctoral support. They've got 15 graduate students, 12 postdocs, four <laughs> master students. You want to steer clear. Because in situations like that, and I've seen it happen too many times, you become another person in the lab, and they're all competing against each other to get results that the PI wants to see. Wants to see. Not reality, but wants to see. And it's a bad situation. So I would stay out of that. A smaller lab, somebody that's in the lab, okay? Somebody that can uh, get you to good publications, and while you're <coughs> doing that, it would be up to you to then look for work where you could publish, say, an opinion article on your own or something else on your own. To to you, you want science administration, right? <coughs> Some way. Well, you know, there's a lot open there too because the NIH has a lot of open administrative positions every year. You might want to consider a postdoc up there. They have postdoctoral positions that open up every year. So. And that would set you up because a lot of them. Actually, one of my mentors left um, ODU and uh, is now at NCCAM, National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. So she doesn't do research there anymore. She uh, runs grant committees, helps make the participates in the de decision process of where they want to go next, what their roadmap will be, what they want to fund, how they want to do it, and things of that nature. So that might be, you know. There was a, um, an article in Science, it was a long one called Careers Away from the Bench. Did any of you see it? I'm gonna find it and email it to you. It's, it's really good. It discusses um, what to do if you don't quite want a career at the bench top and you wanna do something else. And it's become a very a very lucrative field. A lot of people go into that because there's a lot of science policy. Okay, so if you're good reading, communicating, writing, and things like that, that's a whole other branch of science that's open to you once you get your PhD. Stuff. And there was a uh, there's a webinar on it, and there's an article. And if I forget to send it to you, it's a really really good one. Actually, I don't. I gave it to Shabbat, too. Um, and I think there's a website now that you could log on to, if you could follow that. It's like a blog about where you want to go. A lot of nonprofits that have funding that look for people to be up on the literature and decide which grants get funded and things like that. They put them out to committees. American Art. Michael J. Fox Foundation, Alzheimer's Disease Foundation. A lot of openings there are very important ones too. 
what do you think about choosing someone who, who is new to the university? I don't think that should really, as, as long as they fit with you and have a good rapport with their departmental chair and uh, are good instructing you and have some funding to carry you unless your department has different arrangements for that and is well published, it's okay. What you got to watch out for is somebody, you, you, you look at somebody's resume or CV or whatever they have online, and you see that, you know, they published one paper in 1998 and one paper in 2000, and you want to go into that lab. That can be a problem. Okay, it can be a problem with you getting your papers published. And it can be a problem getting the work done. See, a lot of times when, when you're advising a student from my end, okay, and I mentored a lot of students, postdocs and, and, and MD, PhD students, you have to pick a project for them that you pretty well know is going to work and give them data. You don't have the time to do it yourself, but it's, gee, I always wanted to do that because I had this preliminary data and I know it's gonna work. Or I know they're gonna get something out of it. That person has to judge that you're gonna get something out of it. You wanna make sure that you don't pick somebody that might not be such a good <coughs> judge that way. So that you get you know, stuck grinding gears in one place for years and years on end. So that's what you're looking for. Do I trust that this person has enough there to find me a path that'll be a good one for me for the next three or four years? Then I was gonna follow up on the um, on the auger. <laughs> the auger advisor that he said. Oh the auger, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you define boundaries for the older advisor? So, so how do you, you know, how do you it's sort of not, get out of that? It's not my, it was never my boundaries. It was what everybody else said. He's hard to work with. He's very demanding. Uh, well, yeah, he was demanding. And yeah, I worked some long nights. But he gave me a lot of support. All right? So just because someone else says there's an older, even if 50 people say there's an older, how successful is it? Well, maybe there's not a note. Right. Maybe they just, he's got a different work ethic than these people. So, never trust what anybody else says. A little bit, give it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you trade the success for if you really pulls out the organ behavior? Do you say, yeah, I'm, I'm, be, I'm being successful in this lab. So I can deal with some of that. It never really bothered me because it was funny. <laughs> you did what? Actually, one of the things that made you do is for some reason, he had a very large office, and the NYU Institute of Environmental Medicine was up in the Catskills, right, place the Catskills. He had a very big office with a lot of windows, and for some reason, and we don't know why, there were always flies in his office. Maybe he opened the window, he didn't keep food in there, I mean, he had papers. <laughs> But if he did something like that, like really stupid, it's go into my office and kill flies. <laughs> Punish me. In other words, if you're going to waste your time, I'm going to help you with it. That's right. And, 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 it, and it was kind of fun. And it got to the extent where you could really laugh with the gym. I mean, you come in and I, I, come in and I totally screwed up this experiment. And because in one case it was spectrophotometry and it was supposed to be gradations of blue. And it was all too blue. Oh, too blue. What are we going to do about that? And it was just funny then. <laughs> Humor always works. And being honest always works too. I totally screwed this experiment up. You know, that's another thing that a lot of advisors I think don't like. Don't come to me and give me 15 reasons why everything's fine with your experiment. If you feel like you just tell me you screwed it up. Okay, let's go back to the beginning and try to figure out what we need to do next. 
Because everybody does that, including me. If I have a dog here, I could screw up on me. Pretty rich now. Well, you're supposed to make mistakes. It's fine. So how many undergrads are you are, are you from? And and the rest of you all grad students. You're gonna be done soon. That's why you're getting all the additional work here. <laughs> <laughs> I would not select anybody with a big lab. I'd select one with a small to immediate lab, intermediate lab, depending on how they publish. Look at their publications. Okay, and that's what you really, really have to look at because your job as a postdoc is going to be to get those publications, or if you're going into a lab where you know there's support for a year or two, and you want to apply for NIH fellowship, the postdoctoral fellowships, the Ruth Kirchenstein fellowships, or something like that that your investigator has to be mm, well published enough for you to get it. Now, would I say don't go to a young investigator's lab? No, because uh, I have, I've been on the Kirchenstein panels for like six years, okay, seven years, long years. When young, so, yeah, when, when young investigators would come in with a postdoc, with, with asking for postdoc, all we would look at uh, is do they have enough support from their departmental chair? And have they still published a lot? And a lot of times, they got more kudos if they just had one or two graduate students in there than if they had 12 or 15. I know too many students that have gone to large labs with five to eight postdocs and wound up with postdocs competing again. Large lab, that's not to say large lab, a well-funded lab, yes. Because you want to have money for your whole postdoc years and a little pushing thereafter. And well-published, yes. But it's after that, I don't think size should really make that much of a difference. Too many people get lost in really big labs. I get a lot of complaints about that. How do you find this? No, you'll see um, advertisements on Web of Science, uh, sciencejobs.com. Um, when you go to the meetings, and you know when you're when you're in the last year of your PhD, your advisor should be or the person your mentor should be sending you to some national meetings and go to the uh, the job searches there at ASBMB has some good ones. Society of Female Science has some good ones. And then on the web. And it's not, you know, and postdocs are getting a little bit more difficult to find as the funding goes down. What is going up is funding for postdocs. Okay? Uh, postdoctoral associate in my lab for this salary to do X job of research. So it appears very likely that maybe in the next year or two, if you're going into a postdoc, you're going to find an advisor that's going to tell you when you walk in the door, you have to apply for this in a year or two. Because right. it's a bigger pot of money. And the pay lines, the amount, the percent that gets funded is higher than, say, an R01 or R15 or something like that. So the NIH, at least, is making an investment in young scientists and young investigators. So there's a nice pot of money there. So it's always good for you to cultivate your writing and reasoning skills for that one. Yes. Yeah. And there aren't a lot of F31s that come through there under applied for. 
I think I've only seen about six of them, and that's it, in six years. Under applied for. Can you talk about mentors a little bit more? I know you you, you have no fear going into uh, <laughs> who, who they define as a bad mentor because you want to experience it yourself, but uh, where do where did mentors actually help you the transition from the Delaware tobacco and the Well, um, I didn't really have a mentor coming from Delaware to Rutgers. I just went I met with uh, my advisor at Rutgers and that was about it. He gave me some guidance to go more into biochemistry. Um, my mentor at NYU, I kind of, we kind of just fell in each other's lap. So maybe some things are, are, are propitious, some things are just meant to be sometimes. It just falls into somebody's lap. Uh, after that, uh, my mentors were fairly good at EVMS. They didn't have a reason to have to struggle on their own. Okay? Many times mentors will be pushed to get grants. You may have the department that says, oh, you have to bring in two R01s. Okay. Or, or, or you might not get your tenure. Well, nobody's getting two R01s anymore, okay? I think they've limited it to only one now, a million dollars a year. Um, or you have to teach X number of things, and the mentors are just too stressed out by everything else. So I've had one that was that way, okay? In which case, I function pretty much on, uh, on my own. Um, in his case, I actually ended up writing a grant and we submitted it under his name, which was one of my big mistakes. I was kind of fresh out of a postdoc and uh, kind of figured that was what I had to do, and I didn't have mentoring enough. You know, we didn't have groups like this. And there weren't a lot of women in science either. Uh, so I wrote the whole thing top to bottom. We submitted it under his name, and I got it the first round. And I remember him prancing around like a peacock at a faculty meeting about this grant he got, and I just sat there, wasn't even at the faculty meeting, was looking out the door because I was research faculty. All right. I ended up getting another grant a year later that I did put in on my own. Then he tried to say to me, well, make this part of my R01. No, I don't want to do that. And he got mad at me after that. So I was on in the doghouse for three months. But when it came back, I got the grant. Again, first time, first submission. The pay lines were 25%. And then I left six months later. So I realized there comes a time, when, and you could get stuck in that situation too. Do you want to make the mentor terribly mad? Well, no, not terribly mad, but you do what you do and then you get out. You know, that's another strategy. What if I make a, what if you make a mistake in your planning? Okay, so you do what you have to do, and then you get out. There's always a door out. You know, to sit there and say, all right, how am I gonna pick the perfect mentor? And then anything goes wrong, I say, oh, it's because I didn't pick the perfect mentor. No, it's not because you didn't pick the perfect mentor, it's because you didn't say to yourself, okay, I goofed, let's stand up. How are we gonna get ourselves out of this? And you get yourself out and you open. And that's good. Something like that is probably going to happen to, to all of you that go into science. At some point. But you'll know about it. You'll see it ahead of time. As long as you're prepared. So maybe in planning and picking a mentor, it's always good to have a backup plan. If you're one of those that's going to write plans down on paper, always give yourself a backup plan or a couple of backup plans. And if you are stuck with a bad mentor, well, how do you get out? You get your papers out, okay? And then you start applying for the awards that are available to you. Because as young scientists, there are many now. But you get stuck with somebody that doesn't publish, and you're just sitting there grinding gears on a project for however many years going nowhere. 
Well, now you got a bigger problem. That one you should have looked for before you went into that person's lap. Okay? You got to make sure that this isn't the type of person that's going to have you spin your wheels on some, you know, thing he thinks might work in 50 years by saying it's made a mistake or something like that. Okay. So that's one I would advise you to do your best on. Some mentors will try to change your writing to be the way they want it to be. I think we all have that tendency. You've got to try not to do that. That's on the mentor side. Um, and I try not to do that, but I probably still do it. But it's a matter of learning how to express things in science, which can be 20-foot sentences clearly. So sometimes we have a tendency to correct that. I try not to, but I think. And it's okay to say to the advisor, well, I kind of like the way it sounds this way, so why did you change it? Because that's what I used to do. Okay, why did you change it? And, and that should be okay to do. But you've got to expect some of it. So but, I actually experienced that. I just had someone. I was like, can I follow the kid? And then she tried to rework it. No, it's not rude. You, you just, uh, if it were me, I'd politely say, can you tell me, because I want to know how to write things more effectively, okay. why what you wrote here, or how is it different from what I wrote? Okay? And then if that person's your mentor and they're going to give you a grade, well, you got to swallow it and write it that <laughs> way anyway. But nine times out of ten, well, I'll say eight times out of ten, they're going to say, well, maybe it really isn't, or the next time they correct your writing, it might not be that way. Now, I did have that experience with a mentor at one time who was always over it with a red pen. And, you know, you got to realize that, that I was older, too, so I knew how to write. I ran a business. I know how to write with it. All right. And I, and, and, and I actually said to her, look, I think what you're doing is just explaining it the way you would write the sentence. What is grammatically different between what I said and what you said? And I had a good one who sat there and thought about it. She says, well, absolutely not. Right. You might not always get that. But it can't hurt to ask if you do it politely. I think Sometimes. another thing that comes into that is if the journals are refusing your papers or saying the same thing the mentor is saying, 
You better listen. Yeah, now that's another thing. Because I think that's where, you know, a good mentor ideally explains to you what isn't being communicated, rather, as Beverly said, rather than just correcting your word. Yeah. Why is it different. that way? Now, sometimes students tend to put things in science sentences in kind of odd orders. Uh, and that's something that you need to kind of get out of because what I think, what, what I tell a lot of my students is, stop rushing your sentence. What would you say if you had all the space in the world and all the time in the world to write the idea? Write it then. Once you have that down, shorten it. Because many people try to put too many ideas into one place. And they, they just write too, I wouldn't say too quick, it's too less. You know, not enough sentences to explain it as a whole. Because we're hasty in writing. Writing is not like texting. No abbreviations. <laughs> so, uh, I know. Does anybody have a question? So before we wrap this up, maybe you can um, give us your wisdom about what makes, if you were gonna say, the typical successful grad student, what, what would you write down? What would be your, your ID for a successful grad student? Somebody who has a really good sense of humor, I think you have to have that above everything. Somebody who doesn't get frustrated when things go wrong, because they will. Someone who can write fluently, who's cultivated writing and reading, and who can effectively search the literature because I think a lot of hints to potential cures for things or whatever are in the literature. It just takes the right person to read like five articles in a row to put them together. Um, somebody who's willing to work the extra time. A lot of times science is in a nine to five job. Of course, I'm not, if I were to tell you, you should be in the lab from six in the morning till 12 at night, I'd expect you to you know, laugh at me because that's ridiculous too. But you'll find that, you know, a couple of times a quarter, it's going to be a long time. You know, not every day, though. So somebody that has a dedication to uh, go home and read a lot and think. Cultivate thinking, reading, and writing. Do they have to be independent easily? Do they have to solve their own problems? Oh, now, now that's, that's a good point here. Independent in that you get the work done. Some people you could give independence to and they're very wise and they can solve a lot of problems. They're really bright. But when you're not standing over them watching what they're doing, they'd sooner sit and play whatever internet game is on. Or whatever. You have to be able to manage yourself well and be independent. Problem solving, I expect a graduate student to try, come to me with, you know, a few solutions, but check with me. The reason I would say that for a graduate student is because I've made almost all of the mistakes that you could possibly make. <laughs> One of which goes down to the simple art of not vortexing a tube. And having a fine appreciation for just where you pull your distilled water to and how well you mix things. So you might, you know, want to, if you were my graduate student, say, well, I have three ideas of what might be going wrong here. And I'd say, okay, what are they? And I'd say, well, where'd you get your water from? Oh, I pulled it from the common still out in the hallway. Bing. No, go to that one. Or, you know, what did, did you mix this? Well, no, I swirled it. Oh, I've done that before, do you need the board's exit? Or things like that. So yeah, I'd expect you to try to problem solve on your own. But always come and get advice on the problem solve. Eventually you'll make that many mistakes to know anyway, so <laughs> you'll get there too. But always check with a mentor, and they should be willing to check because you don't know, particularly if it's a new field, or a new area for you, 
whether you just might have done something that was missed.